our CSE 215 class for the summer. Um, today we will go over the class organization and uh, we'll also uh, do our first uh, lecture and uh, recitation. As I said earlier, basically all of the lectures and the recitations will be recorded. In order to uh, join synchronously, uh, there are two requirements. One is that you mute uh, yourself and you turn off the camera unless uh, you want to ask a question. And the second is that you have to log in with uh, to see the recording with your uh, at stonybrook.edu email address. So this is a Google Apps uh, account and basically only students registered in this class can join uh, synchronously. So uh, as I said, today we will go over the uh, class information and we'll do our first lecture. So your starting point for this class is your Blackboard page for the class. So on the Blackboard page for the class, if you go to announcements, you see that there are uh, several links that were posted and several announcements. One is a link to our Piazza website uh, where you can ask questions and get uh, also respond to questions. Uh, we will post a lot of information on Piazza. Uh, basically, we'll post the recordings for this class. We'll post uh, uh, office hours. Um, there is already a question that there is a Zoom page. No, uh, it hasn't been announced such a thing. So this class uh, uses, as you saw on Piazza, uh, a Google Meet for the class. So if someone can respond to that question uh, that someone has posted, please do so. Actually, I can do it right now. And uh, they will join using, actually, let's make sure that they do that. So uh, that is done. I know some of you and the TAs are also joining today. Uh, so please do post answers to people that uh, come late and they haven't seen the announcements that we sent through email and through Piazza and through Blackboard about this class. Okay. So let's recap everything. So there is a Piazza link to our Piazza that uh, is for posting questions and answers. There is a course website, a public course website, where we post all of the course materials for this semester. We'll start with the syllabus, but uh, there are other information posted there, like lecture notes and uh, uh, the class schedule, the time and days of the exams and so on. Okay. So, also, the class information from SOLAR is that this is CSC 215, uh, Foundations of Computer Science. The class number is 631 through 32. It's between July 6th, uh, today is July 7th, but the semester started yesterday and August 15th. Uh, it's online, it's web-based, uh, start from Stony Brook University Blackboard in order to reach Piazza and from Piazza to reach uh, uh, basically the Google Meet that we are using for this class. Uh, the time of the class is between 9 a.m. to 12.25 p.m., followed by the re uh, recitation, which is from 12.30 to 1.25 p.m. I'm the instructor for the class. My name is Paul Fodor. I'm a professor in computer science department. Uh, and it's a synchronous online class, but the videos will be recorded. I already started the recording and will be posted on, uh, from Piazza. In fact, my goal is also to upload these um, videos to YouTube. Uh, so basically you can watch them there. Uh, any way you want. You can double speed, use the closed captioning, automatic closed captioning and so on. There are also other posts on, uh, on the Blackboard website. Like for instance, for those of you that are Stony Brook students, there is a link to the Stony Brook Computing Society, the Women in Computer Science and 
Stony Brook Game Developers Clubs at Stony Brook. Good. So the syllabus is in two different places. First is the required uh, place on Blackboard where you will find the PDF of the syllabus. But uh, the place that you should look for the syllabus is our uh, public course website, which basically describes the course, uh, the grading schema, uh, the exam dates, and any other information that uh, is important. We'll actually go over the syllabus. The lecture notes for today basically cover the syllabus completely and uh, a bit more, uh, basically, about uh, mathematical reasoning and so on. Um, before we start to go through the syllabus, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, so some of you outside the university wants to join the class. At this time, as I said, you will have to use your Stony Brook account to join this class. There are about 100 people in the class, uh, 95 that were enrolled this morning, but I assume that seats will be taken soon. Again, if uh, you can, please mute yourself unless you have a question. Okay. So let's go over the course information for this class. And uh, at any time you have questions, you can basically ask me questions. But I, was, I would assume that you want first to go over the course website to make sure that uh, uh, you know the information that is already available. Okay. So this is Foundations of Computer Science, a required course for all computer science majors at Stony Brook University. Uh, it's offered in summer session 2, 2020. Uh, I'm the instructor, Paul Fodor, and the official website for the class, which basically has these public lecture notes that uh, you can actually uh, read, and also the syllabus, is this website. This is actually the standard website for all of the computer science classes at Stony Brook, uh, www.cs.stonybrook.edu slash tilde CSC215 in this case. So what is this course? It's an introduction to uh, logical and mathematical foundations of computer science, and the topics include functions, relations, sets, recursion and functional programming, elementary logic, and the mathematical induction and other proofs techniques. So we'll actually go in a different order over these topics. We start with logic, then we'll go to number theory and proof techniques like induction. Then we'll finish with functions, functional programming and relations. Now, although there is a little bit of computer programming, when we learn functions, we'll actually use a um, programming language called standard ML which maps very well to function definitions. You basically write functions in the same way that you would write in mathematics with the functional notation. You will basically define what the function is, like, like f of x is x plus one. So we'll, and then it gives you back that was the domain and the codomain or range for this function. And you can use that function this is not a course in computer programming, but on the fundament fundamental concepts of computing. And we will stress through this course mathematical problem uh, solving skills and the use of formal concepts as tools in computer, uh, computer science. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the next few slides. The prerequisites for this class are these three classes at Stony Brook, which are calculus or basically calculus one. The outcomes for this course, which are basically mapped to our accreditation requirements, uh, and they are agreed by all the faculty that teach this course, and in fact, all of the faculty in computer science at Stony Brook, is that at the end of this course, you will gain an ability to define and use discrete structures, such as functions, relations, and sets. An ability to compute with recursion as the basic paradigm. We'll talk more about recursions uh, when we do functions. And an ability to use logic and basic proof techniques such as mathematical induction. So again, it doesn't follow exactly what is the uh, sequence of topics that we cover. We'll actually start with logic, which is the last outcome that you see here. 
Then we'll continue with proof techniques, which is also in the last outcome. Then we will actually go to uh, functions, relations, and sets, and recursion towards the end of the semester. So again, let's return back why a course in discrete math is the perfect foundation for computer science. And the reason why is that we, we want to study mathematics and problem solving for computer science in order to gain a rigorous uh, way to develop problems, large uh, uh, solutions to programs. And the reason is that computer science is not computer programming. Although programming is a large part of it, it's probably 80% of it. But computer science is a mathematical science, and mathematics was developed for thousands of years and is rigorous. It has a perfect mechanism to learn uh, co correct and uh, complete ways of s solving problems. So also, a lot of courses in computer science will use the skills that we learn in this class. So we'll learn the capabilities and limitations to computer programs and how people solve them effectively. Many topics in computer science map to the topics that we learn today and we learned in the next classes like databases are just relations. We learn relations, we learn the properties of relations and databases today are actually relational databases which you actually use relations to compute complex joins, filter, project on the properties that you want, the arguments of these relations. So basically a lot of topics in computer science map to basic mathematical uh, formalisms that were developed for thousands of years. Also computer programs require the exact sequence of steps to perform a task and must be specified completely and precisely. And we'll basically learn exactly this precision in this course uh, on starting with logic being the most fundamental way to prove statements. Again, mathematics was developed over thousands of years. Uh, propositional logic was actually invented by Socrates and Plato 300 years before uh, our era. And we learned basically mathematics as a method of abstract reasoning. Also, We'll see later when we learn more about programming, like for instance, in our principles of programming languages course, that there are languages that map exactly to the formalism that we learn today, like logic programming or functional programming. And they become more and more useful in complex uh, programming techniques like distributed programming, because they have a precise way to prove their correctness and actually to formalize statements from natural language to, to mathematics, to logic. Now, another question is why computer science is just uh, not just programming? Uh, and the truth is that you will find a lot of websites that teach you uh, to program short programs, like a few hundred lines of code uh, with little training. In fact, Python was a programming language developed for this reason. It's developed to uh, basically program as close as you can to natural language. But real world software programs are very large and you have to work in groups with other programmers. And what we want to learn in computer science is developing and understanding complex objects that require a mathematical discipline to build them. Any single computer science uh, degree that you would ever take in anywhere, in any university in the world includes a course in foundations of computer science. Also, real world software systems must be reliable. They control economies, airplanes, nuclear weapons, and in some cases, your own car now relies on uh, software systems. And again, a systematic discipline like mathematics is necessary to avoid errors and lose lives in this case. Also, mathematics provides the discipline and systematic language to reason about systems. So today we'll actually 
go into a little bit more deep uh, uh, ideas in this uh, area and also topics that you may have covered in high school. Some of you may have actually even covered entire topics that uh, will cover this semester in high school. But because we don't actually know where everybody is coming from, we'll cover them completely in this class. So one feature of CSC 215, our class, is that it's self-contained. Basically, all of the uh, topics that we will cover, we'll cover them from scratch with no pre-condition that you must know something except basic mathematics in order to understand this, uh, this class. So let's return back to the syllabus. Blackboard will be used for assignments, grades, and course material. So for instance, all assignments will be posted in Blackboard assignments. The grades will be available through my grades in Blackboard uh, for privacy reasons. And uh, the course material will be linked from Blackboard. So the lecture notes are public on the computer science public website. And if there is anything that cannot be made public, uh, will be posted uh, on Piazza, which only students in this class can access. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul Fodor. I'm uh, a faculty in computer science department. My office is 214 New Computer Science Department at Stony Brook University. My email is paul.fodor at stonybrook.edu. If you have any questions of private nature, you can actually We'll talk about communication a little bit later, but you can either send me an email or uh, put it on, uh, post it on Piazza as a private message. And uh, we will try to respond to Piazza questions as soon as we get them. And in fact, we already responded to a few of them, but we have, uh, I don't promise that, but last semester, for instance, we had an average time of three minutes to respond to questions, either us or the TAs or other students. So as soon as we can, humanly possible, we will respond to all questions. The lectures will be online using our Google Meets uh, that we are using today. Also, office hours and recitations will be kept exactly in the same place. So the lecture will be Tuesday and Thursdays from 9 to 12.25 p.m. We already have the lecture right now. Uh, the recitation will follow the lecture for 55 minutes from 12.30 to 1.25 p.m. I will keep the recitation today. Uh, and starting on Thursday, my TAs will keep the recitations. Uh, we'll go over the TAs in a few minutes when we go to Piazza. We have three graduate TAs for this class, which were TAs before uh, for me, uh, some of them. And they basically are very good TAs that uh, will keep office hours, will help me with grading, and uh, will keep the recitations. OK, the textbook is optional. Uh, the lecture notes contain everything that is required to solve the homework assignments and to do well in the exams. Uh, I'm following very closely the Discrete Mathematics Introduction to Mathematical Reasoning by author Susanna Epp, uh, which was published as the first edition in 2011. But as I said, everything that I will cover is in the lecture notes. And uh, the, le the textbook is a very good textbook. Um, I, I will give assignments from the textbook, but I will give you the problems that's allowed. Uh, on Piazza, under a uh, restricted website, only the students in this class. will also solve uh, a lot of problems from this textbook. It is a very good textbook. It contains a lot of historical information, which I find extremely interesting about uh, the people that actually made the discoveries about the mathematical uh, skills that we talk about in this class. And I find them extremely interesting. And I really advise you, if you can get hold of a copy of the textbook, uh, you should. But it, again, it's not required for this class. It's totally optional. The lecture notes cover everything that you need to do well in this class. The grading will be based on the homework assignments and exams according to the following formula. The homeworks, which 
probably there will be five homeworks. I will post the first homework this week due next Thursday, so a week in advance. Uh, the midterm exams are 25% each and the final exam is 25%. All of these exams, the three exams that we have for this class will be held on a Respondus Lockdown Browser with monitoring on Blackboard. So basically, I will send instructions uh, actually today how to download the Lockdown Browser. It's a separate browser that allows you to open a single tab, which is the black uh, Blackboard. Uh, this browser also records the video during the exam between when you start the exam until the end of the exam. So there is a requirement of a webcam in for your computer in this class. Now the exams are scheduled during the class time. So those three exams you cannot miss unless you have uh, an extenuating circumstance like a disease, uh, where you, you are ill and unfit to take the exam at the required time. Uh, if you do miss an exam for a valid reason, one of the, the reasons uh, listed above, then uh, we will give you a makeup exam and uh, that will be done case by case basis. Now, the grade cutoffs that guarantee you that you will get a certain grade are 95 to 100 uh, of the total points uh, for A, 90 to 95 for A minus, 87 to 90 for B plus, 83 to 87 for B, 80 to 83 for B minus, 70. So basically now you can see that Bs are between 80 and 90. Uh, Cs are between 70 and 80. These are between 60 and 70, and finally, anything below uh, 60 uh, is an F. However, there is a special rule that if your grades, uh, including the homework assignments, quizzes, uh, in this case, we don't have quizzes and recitation, but basically the homework assignments and recitation and uh, your three exams are above the average of the class, uh, grades, you are guaranteed to receive a C or higher for this class. So it's the best of both worlds. Basically, the uh, cutoffs guarantee that you will get a grade or higher, but then there is the curving below that says that is a C curve. So basically, let's say that the average in the class is below 70, is let's say 65. That means that with the 65, you will not get a D plus, you will get a C or higher. So it's basically the, and then all of the, uh, the cutoffs will shift down with that number of points that the average was below the minimum grade for C, which is 73. So basically it's the best of two words. It says that you, if you get at least, let's say an 80, you're, guaranteed that you will get a B minus or higher. But the average in the class will also allow you to get higher. So basically the, the grade cutoffs guarantee that you get a minimum grade and the special rule, which is really curving, tells you that you can get higher than that uh, minimum uh, grade that you could get, okay? Uh, before I continue, with other issues about uh, grading and homeworks and so on. Do you have any questions about uh, these rules for grading? The grading is probably most important to you as you want to get a good grade in this class. Uh, I have a question about, um, so the grade cutoffs, like yeah. there's 77 is in both C plus and C. So if you get a 77, is that but a C or this C This is a range. It basically, it's not because it says that it includes, so this is a set notation for real numbers. It says that from 77 included, because there is the uh, square bracket, up to 80 not included is a C plus. And C, it says that is 77 in, uh, 73 included, but 77 not included. So the meaning of brackets uh, in set notation is that square bracket means included, and curve bracket 
means not included up to that range it's on the real axis it says that here is where it starts so for instance let's let's look at uh, ace it says that anything above and including 95 sharp is an a a minus says that from 90 included up to 95 but not included it's an a minus now it's always the case that you may actually have let's say 94.90 okay that's basically very very close to an a minus and i assure you that i will round up basically i will probably give you an a i, I will definitely give you an a if you round up to the higher grade because i do understand that you don't want to fight uh, uh, like basically ask to regrade some question in the exam although it's mathematics this is very exact uh, but I do expect that we may have some issue about uh, rounding when you want to get to a, a certain uh, uh, number to get a grade okay but then there are other issues like what if you get uh, uh, 94.47 because now actually the 94.5 is actually the limit that gives you an A so this is what we have posted and we go with it and then we have the special rule that allows one to get a better grade uh, if the average is below 70, uh, 73 does this respond to your question okay i assume yes okay good so let's actually see if there are any other questions on the chat okay there, there are plenty of questions on the chat uh there is a link to latex that doesn't work mm, okay i will post the lecture notes on latex although i'm not requiring that you will use latex for homeworks or anything else the reason why LaTeX is very popular for programming, for basically writing mathematical documents, is that it's very easy. Uh, it has a markup language that allows one to write formulas in a very easy way without, basically, you don't have a lot of uh, keys, a lot of symbols or characters that you need on your keyboard, like integrals, differentials, uh, sets, uh, certain set no, uh, notations, and LaTeX is used for uh, such uh, documents, but I will not require it. So I will make uh, the link, but that's uh, not a required document. Okay. Okay, yes. So if the average of the class is 70, uh, to respond to Henry's question, then the uh, cutoff for A will become 92. Very, very good. Because basically 73 was before the cutoff for a C, but now 70 will be the cutoff for a C, which is three points below. So the cutoff for A will become 95 minus 3, which is 92. Very good question. Okay. I think it's a problem with your computer because... Uh, uh, does everyone else hear me or see me or see the lecture notes? Yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And of course, you can also unmute yourself if you have a question. Excellent. Good. So everything seems to be fine up to now. Good. So now... In the spring semester, you all got emails about the new rules for the spring semester for the pass no credit option. However, up to my knowledge, those rules have not been extended to cover the summer. So we are going with the standard rules for the pass no credit option uh, that applies to all computer science undergraduate courses that are used to satisfy the graduation requirements for the major 
And that standard rule is that the pass no credit option is not available for this course. I assume that this will not be uh, an option, uh, that you will not have the option that you have for the spring semester, for those of you that are Stony Brook students, which are, I assume, majority in the, uh, those students in this class, for the summer. So the reason why the, those special rules were made for the spring was that you started the spring as in-person class, and then we had the COVID pandemics, uh, pandemic, and now you basically, and then you were basically stuck in the class. But that's not does not apply to the summer course. The summer course, we are just starting, and you are still, it's still a, a possible to drop the course or to join the course later. So we are going with the standard uh, rules. Uh, this is not decided by me or by the department. It's actually decided by registrar, the administration of Stony Brook. And the requirement is that if you start a class, you will get a grade in that class, uh, A to F. Uh, however, nobody knows what will be the decision by the end of this summer session in six weeks. So it may be possible that they will change the rules, uh, that you can take a pass no credit option. But at this time, I'm not aware of such option. The exam dates are also posted in the schedule. Uh, we'll have the first midterm on July uh, 21st, again with responses logged on browser with monitoring. For that you need a working webcam. Uh, we'll also have a practice exam also with lockdown browser with monitoring. I will actually uh, try to organize it this week in case that it doesn't work for you, you will basically have the option to uh, get a work uh, working webcam or uh, to basically drop the course if there is no other option for you to take the course. Uh, due to the ongoing pandemic, we cannot meet in person for you to take the exam. Again, uh, the dates for the midterms are July 21st and July 30th, and the final exam is in August 13th. The session, the summer two session, has only six weeks, so these exams are very uh, close to each other, but basically this is the summer session. There is no other option that we can take. Again, the, the grades will be posted on Blackboard for both assignments and uh, exams for privacy reasons. Go to Blackboard for the class and uh, go to My Grades. There will be homework assignments given regularly. They will be posted after the class on the topic that will be covered in that homework. The homework assignments are to be completed in, in individually in the allotted time up to the deadline. No late submissions will be allowed, no makeup homeworks will be given, and the homework assignment will be posted on Blackboard again in assignments. So, very strict but simple rules. There will be a homework posted in uh, Blackboard assignments. Uh, it will be announced on Piazza, and you have to solve it by the deadline immediately after the deadline passes, which is usually at midnight on uh, the day that the deadline, the homework is due, uh, the submission will close and will grade it. And then the grade will be available on Blackboard within at most a week after the homework was due. Also, it will be posted on Piazza and basically you have another week to uh, talk with me or the TAs if you want a regrade which takes us to regrading. So because there is a very high pace for this class, uh, please meet with your TA or any of the TAs during office hours or me as the instructor to arrange for regrading. You have one week from the day that the grades are posted or emailed or announced on Piazza. We'll try to make this very simple. We post very clear messages on Piazza uh, about when the grade was uh, posted and then you have one week to arrange for regrading or basically if uh, uh, all of these uh, grades and the comments that we give you back 
will be available on Blackboard. So only if you think that something was wrong in the grading, you will have to uh, contact us within a week during office hours, and we'll basically go over those problems that uh, need to be regraded uh, with you. Late requests cannot be entertained. And the, I told you the reason that there is very high pace for this class and three days within the end of the semester, the final exam, by rules, by the rules of the university, we have to post your final grade on solar. So, so this is the tentative class schedule. We have six weeks, two lectures per week, two uh, recitations per week. Uh, it basically covers, as I st stated, today we cover the logic of compound statements, also called uh, propositional logic. Today, we'll start logical arguments. I don't know how much we'll cover from logical arguments within the time allotted for today, but probably about uh, uh, half of it. And then we'll start quantified statements or first of the logic next class and we'll cover it. So today we'll actually cover chapter one and chapter two or part of chapter two. On Thursday, we'll cover the entire chapter three and that's all about logic. Then next week, we'll do number theory and induction and uh, we'll basically have a midterm exam the following week on July 21st. Then we'll cover set theory and functions, and we'll have a second midterm uh, on July 30th. We'll cover recursion and functional programming and relations, uh, and then we'll have the final exam. So it was a little bit difficult to uh, schedule midterm two because I wanted to schedule midterm. So midterm one, we wanted to schedule it within two weeks. I couldn't give you a midterm next week. It would have been very early and most of you are just starting now to do this course. So uh, basically you need time to prepare. Then midterm three, uh, the final exam was in the last day of classes, the last lecture, which basically meant that we have to put midterm two sometime within the uh, uh, two weeks, three weeks that are between, two weeks and a half that are between the uh, two uh, midterm one and final exam. And I decided that it's easier to have on the Thursday, the 30th, than actually to have a, a, a midterm followed by another final exam the following week. So this is set for now because the syllabus is kind of like a contract between the faculty and the students. And uh, will go with it. I hope that everybody is fine with the schedule. There was already a question that I've got by email that how often are these exams, but I consider them to be very important to test the material of this class. Okay, so academic integrity. So this class is an online class and there are two kind of academic dishonesty that can happen. One is that the homeworks are not solved independently and that uh, some cheating happens during the exams. Regarding the homeworks, you can discuss general concepts with other students, explain how to use systems or tools uh, and helping others with higher level design issues. You may not share assignments, source code, and other uh, answers by copying, retyping, looking at, or supplying a file. And we do check these assignments. So if you submit, let's say, two homeworks, we do check them for similarity using automatic tools that actually get if code or uh, documents are identical or they originate from common documents. So usually this happens only in the programming assignments. So towards the end of the semester, we'll have programming assignments in standard ML. It's a very simple programming language that allows one to write functions and recursive functions. It's not difficult to write in these languages, but I do prevent that uh, students will not copy assignments from each other. 
And these are checked automatically with tools like Moss from Stanford that takes all of the assignments in the class and tells me with very high precision if some of them are developed in, uh, uh, in collaboration. So one thing that I have to tell you is that is a known fact that uh, anything more than five lines of identical code, uh, including spacing and same names for variables, is a high probability that the that that, that specific uh, uh, assignment is copied, because there are no two people that write identically the same code. So in SML, for instance, you will have very short programs, but there is very low probability that you will use the same indentation, the same names of variables, the same names of functions, the same names of everything, and the same spacing to have identical lines of code. So we'll actually check and we'll actually detect if things are uh, uh, identical. And if you do cheat, then you will be brought up to academic dishonesty charges. We follow the university policy that will have to report them. And then it's basically an issue at the university level. This is very important. And my job is to tell you at the beginning of the semester that any academic dishonesty is not accepted at Stony Brook. OK. If you have a physical, psychological, medical, or learning disability, contact the sex office at this phone number. And basically, they will uh, contact me to tell me what accommodations to give uh, uh, to students. If time is needed, extra time is needed for exams or for other assignments, it all goes through this office. I personally cannot make decisions about medical issues and uh, all of this has to, has to go through this office. All documentation of disability is confidential. They contact me and uh, I will basically contact you to tell you if you do have, uh, if basically what, ex what accommodations they allowed me to make to you. And, this is very, it's possible, I, there is a very easy way to add such uh, special cases to exams and to homeworks that gives you a little bit more time or other accommodation that you may need. So what do you need to get started? Blackboard. Every student at Stony Brook has a Blackboard uh, account. You log in and then you basically get to the class for this, uh, for this course. And from Blackboard, there are links to the public lecture notes and links to Piazza. Everything else is on Blackboard itself. So you will see in Blackboard uh, assignments and your grades. OK, so before we continue with first chapter of app, actually just an introduction to what is known to probably you. Uh, let's actually see if there are any questions. Uh, that you may have about the syllabus. Okay. So as I said earlier, if you want to see the lecture, you will have to join with your uh, Stony Brook account. Otherwise, you cannot uh, see the online lecture. You will see it on YouTube if it's posted publicly, but uh, not at this time. Okay. So I see that uh, Google Meet works on Chrome. Excellent. What hours are the exams on those dates? They start at the time of the class. And depending on the exam, will last for a certain period of time. So I haven't yet decided. Normally, we have exams, midterm exams of 80 minutes, which is the length of a uh, class during uh, uh, normal semester, like not a summer session, spring or fall. And then we have a final of two hours. However, this semester I haven't yet decided because we'll basically have to cover the, the material necessary for these exams. And depending on how much it takes me to cover this material, we'll decide if the exams are two hours each. Actually, let's decide at this time. So every exam is two hours. So it will start, all exams will start at 
9 and we'll end up at 11, after which we'll continue with the lecture for the day. Okay? So I will post this on Piazza as soon as uh, the class ends for, to, for the day. Thank you very much for that question. Are the exams and final cumulative? No. Each exam it's, uh, basically covers the material uh, taught between the previous exam and the current exam. So, for instance, if you take midterm 2, it will have questions from set theory and functions. If you take final exam, it will have questions from recursion, functional programming in ML and relations. So all the exams are, once we finish with the topic, we move on to the next topics and we, we respond to questions about those topics. Uh, you can buy the textbook on Amazon. Uh, the textbook is optional as Vasuda, uh, our TA, and we'll go over the TAs in a couple of seconds. Uh, already stated, uh, I see a link to the Amazon textbook. Uh, there is a link to a PDF uh, <laughs> posted by a student. Uh, are the midterms cumulative? Uh, as I said earlier, no. Okay, so we'll take breaks from time to time when we cover a certain section set, uh, and then we'll continue, we'll take a 10 minutes break and we'll continue to the next section. Uh, are you required to use LaTeX for the homework? No, it's again optional. You can use uh, Word or you can use even text uh, editors like Notepad. Uh, I don't see any problem with that. Some of you will probably use LaTeX, but it's not required in any way. Okay, good. Any questions at this time? You can also unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Can we write out the homework? Yes, and then you can scan it and uh, upload the PDF as the homework uh, uh, as your homework in Blackboard. Of course, that's all that's accepted. Okay, excellent. So if you have more questions, yes, for the readings, those are the chapters in the original textbook. I have a paper copy of the textbook, uh, but really you can, you, Basically, the lecture notes cover everything required for the exams. So the textbook contains uh, more material, uh, mostly historical facts, but uh, also they go, they describe every single issue in detail. While most of the proofs that we will go over are actually in the lecture notes. So the textbook is optional, is really optional. I don't require you to buy it. I do understand that uh, textbooks are extremely expensive. It's a good textbook, but it's really up to you. What's the format of the exam? Will it be a combination of multi-choice and short response? Uh, in the past, all exams questions were basically give a, you are given a problem and you have to solve it. There are no multi-choice questions that we used for this type of uh, class because it's mathematics. You have to prove things. You cannot be given a proof and then you have to tell me if it's correct or not. That's not how mathematics is done. So in the past, I used to teach this class with questions. Here is a formula, prove it using uh, logical equivalences or the Quine's method or here is an induction that you have to write and you have to write that induction. The best way to actually learn how to do it is to write it in Notepad because you will use basically a lockdown browser, which is really a text area that you have available to put your answer. So I'm not planning at this time to use multi-choice questions. Uh, that's not how mathematics is done. Okay, good. So let's just 
finish the first set of lecture notes, which is basically what I want to cover is just uh, what uh, type of what what are the mathematical fundamentals that you learned in high school and probably even elementary school uh, and that we are going to use in this class. And the first term that we have to learn is variables. And up to the 18th century, all proofs in logic or in mathematics were done in natural language. So people will prove things given written in English or written in any other foreign language that was describing mathematical formulas. So for instance, a sentence here says, is there a number with the following property that doubling it and adding three to it gives the same result as squaring it? Now, people in those centuries would take this sentence in English and then they will describe the steps also in English. However, it's much easier to actually abstract this using variables. So in this sentence, you can introduce a variable to replace that potentially ambiguous word it. And you don't need, now this squaring it, you don't need to use uh, in natural language processing is called anaphora resolution or co-referencing to understand that it means the original number. So when we say doubling it or squaring it, it means that original number. So you need some kind of a reference. And in this case, we use a variable x and you state the formula in mathematics, in arithmetics as follows. Two multiply with x plus three is equal with x squared, where x is the number that we are looking for. And now we have to, to solve an equation as opposed to respond to a question in natural language. So really variables is a placeholder for multiple places when we, where we reference the same memory. And that's exactly the same for programming languages. A variable is just an alias for a location in memory, which you can assign values to or read values from. So a variable is basically a location that you can reference at any time later. Similar to that, we can actually use, again, a variable for an inequation. So no matter what number might be chosen, if it's greater than two, then its square is greater than four. Again, a variable, it's a temporary name to that number that you may choose to maintain the same generality of the statement. No matter what number n you may choose, if n is greater than two, then n squared is greater than four. So we use variables to basically annotate locations in memory and then reference them later. Now, there are actually two steps that we are doing here. First, we actually introduce the variable like n or x, and then we use mathematical formulas like from arithmetics or from other parts of mathematics to write abstractly the same statement. And we'll see that, for instance, for the second statement, the second example that we have here, we can actually uh, write it in logic with it's not true that for all numbers, and we can actually use quantifiers, we can use negation, we can use implication in this case, because it's an if then statement. And this is done later in when we start learning about logic, we start learning about number theory. And although in our uh, homeworks, for instance, we'll probably use English words because they are easier to type than mathematical formulas, will basically uh, write the same statements, but in mathematics. So for the moment, if you don't know what variables are, just know that variables are a way to address a location in memory. Now, in logic, we will see that there are statements and those statements apply either on some objects or on all objects. So when, we start with propositional logic. We have propositional variables like statements outside these 82 degrees, uh, and that may be true or false. Then we will move on to quantified logic. 
uh, first of the logic that contains quantifiers, universal or existential quantifiers. And really those are translated into English in two phrases, for all, for universal quantifiers, and there exist or there is for existential quantifiers. And here we have such examples. We have a universal conditional statement or a universal implication. For all animals A, if A is a dog, then A is a mammal. So this can be written in logic and we'll learn how to write it with quantifiers. But really what we are doing here is kind of like natural language understanding. Given an English sentence, we collect from the sentence these quantifiers, like for all is the universal quantifier. If then is a condition, it's an implication. Similarly, universal existential statements are those statements where you have a universal, state, uh, universal quantifier and an existential quantifier. So this statement has such a form. Every real number has an additive inverse. So there exists an additive inverse for every real number. So we'll learn how to write these from English to logic and vice versa when we are given a logic formula how to read it uh, in English or in natural language. Existential universal statements is we will see that universal existential statements are when the universal quantifier is first and the existential statement is next. Is next. Existential universal statements are those when there exists an object for which for all values some property holds. And they are very different. So it, we have statements where we have a universal existential statement true and there are statements when there are existential universal statements true and their opposite if we reverse the quantifiers is false and vice versa if it's false uh, the opposite may be true and here the example is there is a positive integer that is less than or equal to every positive integer so in this case we can give uh, as an example one one is less than equal than any other positive integer is greater than zero. So it's an existential universal statement. We have the existential quantifier appearing to the left of the universal quantifier every. We'll see the difference and we'll learn uh, on many different examples. We have examples from academia, like uh, let's say there is a cafeteria with multiple objects and students eating at that cafeteria. There are examples in a specific word called the Tarski word, in which basically you have to uh, write these statements on a uh, grid that contains geometrical objects. And again, it's straightforward from natural language or from English. However, natural language is ambiguous in many cases. A uh, standard example is I'm watching someone with a telescope. There are two different logical ways to write it. I'm watching someone that holds a telescope or I'm watching someone using a telescope. So now we can basically see that uh, there are two different statements that can be written. So natural language is ambiguous in certain ways. Logic is always straightforward and strict. You know exactly from the form of the logical formula what's the meaning of that formula. And we'll basically use logic to prove uh, you also, it's very difficult, as we saw before, if you write a statement in English, like these statements, it's very difficult to prove them in English, although for almost 2,000 years, people were doing that in English, instead of using abstractions like variables and uh, arithmetics and logic. Only uh, starting with George Bull, they started using uh, the mathematical notation that we have today for logic. And later, they introduced truth tables that we'll discuss about today. So uh, Winterstein did that. So basically, it's very uh, good that we have the current state of the art, that we have abstraction on top of natural language, because we have an unambiguous, uh, straight, strict way to write statements and understand their meaning. Okay. Next topic that we will cover in this class are sets. 
Sets were actually introduced as a formal mechanism uh, in mathematics by George Cantor in 1879 and intuitively is a collection of elements. And there are multiple notations for sets. Sometimes you are given all the elements uh, of the set, like a discrete set that contains the elements 1, 2, 3, another set B that co contains the elements 3, 1, 2. And in sets, the order doesn't matter. So in fact, the two sets A and B are equal to each other because all that we are interested in is, is this collection of elements the same with that collection of elements. And that is true if every single element from every one of the two sets also belongs to the other set. Another set here is C, which is 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3. But really, sets have only unique elements. They are different than bags. Bags they can contain a, an element multiple times. So the set C is exactly the same with the sets A and B. So if you are asking what are the elements of A, B, and C, they are one. One is a member of every one of these sets. Two is a member of every one of these sets. And three is a member of every one of these sets. How are A, B, and C related? They are equal because all of the elements of A are also in B and vice versa, all the elements in B are also in A. So we learn all the pop uh, possible ways to combine sets, to check properties about sets and their elements. Now, sometimes we have infinite sets. We cannot enumerate all of the members of the set. And for that, there is a different notation called the set builder notation. So in this example, we have a real set that says that we want all of the real numbers between minus 2, not included, and uh, 5. So, in fact, this comes back to a question that we got, got a couple of minutes ago, which was, what is that notation mm, minus 2 to 5? So this notation is all of the elements in reals on the real axis that are strictly greater than minus two and strictly less than five. And that's basically what uh, this notation, the set builder notation says. It's all of the reals with this property. So the after the vertical bar, there is a logical property that tells me from this domain, which are the elements that will be in this set. And we'll learn all of the possible properties of sets. Most important uh, relationship between sets uh, or relation between sets is the subset notation. So the subset notation states that the left set is a subset of the right set, meaning that every element in the left set, like two in this case, is a member of the right set. Again, this is just an overview of stuff that you should know from high school or even before that uh, elementary school, but we'll cover it uh, in every single topic that we learn. Again, CSC 215 is self-contained. All of the topics that you will learn are in this class and nowhere else. We'll learn about relations. And one important relation is what is called the Cartesian product. Uh, given two uh, sets, reals and reals, the set of all the possible ordered pairs, X and Y, where X belongs to the first set and Y belongs to the second set, in this case, both are reals, are basically all the possible points in the Cartesian plane. So given the two axes, X and Y, you can actually take every any single point in this plane and give me the X and Y coordinates, meaning the tuple that contains the X as the first value and the Y as the second value. So as we can see in this example, 2, 1 is uh, one of the points in this plane. 1 minus 2 is one of the points in this plane. Minus 2 minus 2 is one of the points in this plane, and so on. So relations are this kind of tuples, but you can have longer relations. But in this case, we are talking about binary relations. R is in the relation R, uh, X is in the relation R with Y as a shorthand for x is related to y, and here we have an example. 1 is less than 2. Less than is a relation, 
uh, it basically states what is the truth value for this relation. Is it true that one is less than two? Yes. So you can have uh, these relations can be translated into logic and more importantly can be translated into sets. X is in the relation R with Y if the tuple XY is a member of the relation R. And you can also write them as diagrams, which we will see that they are most useful for functions, a different type of relations where the element in the domain has a single mapping, one unique mapping in the codomain. So here we have multiple examples. We can have a relation that takes every element in the first set and relate it to two other elements in the second set, or a relation that takes one element in the first set and maps it to two different relations, two different values in the second set. So relations make no cardinality restrictions on how many elements you take from the first set and how many mappings they have in the second set. As opposed to functions, which they are a specific kind of relation. A function f from a set A to a set B is a relation where the domain uh, is A, basically the first set is A, and the codomain is B, which satisfies two properties. The first property says that for every element x in A, there is an element y in B, such that x, y belongs to the function f set. So basically, every element in the domain has at least one mapping in the codomain. But the second rule says that for all of the elements x in A and y and z in B, if x and y as a tuple belongs to the function and x to z as a tuple belongs to the function, then y must be equal with z. Basically, it states that there cannot be multiple mappings for the same element x in the second set. So the first set says that every single element in the domain has a mapping, and the second one says that has exactly one mapping. Uh, if there are multiple mappings, they must be equal. And here we have an example of a successor function. G is a function that for every integer n is n plus one. So it basically it's maps an infinite domain to an infinite code domain by mapping the elements in corresponding order. So my only requirement for this class is basically, if you want to watch the synchronous lecture, please be on time. Show respect to your classmates. Do not post uh, bad messages on the chat or on Piazza. Please turn off uh, your cell phone if you are not muted. Please mute yourself. and. On-topic questions are welcome. We'll actually not ask questions from the topics that we covered in this first organizational lecture in the exams or anywhere else. So the exams are really based on the material that we cover starting from now on with uh, the logic of compound statements. Really, what we just covered up to now is part of the organization. What is this class based on and where are we going? Welcome and enjoy the class. So I will take a few questions, then I will stop the recording so I can basically post it on uh, uh, Piazza uh, following the lecture. And then we'll, call, we'll start with the first, uh, actually the first real lecture of this semester, which is basically the second chapter of the textbook. Thank you very much. So let's see if there are any questions either in the chat or even easier, just unmute yourself if you have a question and we'll respond to it. So I don't see, okay. Yes, so only there is one question from Tina that is, uh, is it true that A equal B equal C? Yes, in set theory is true. And we'll actually define that relationship explicitly that what does it mean A equal B? It means that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Was this the end of the lecture for today? No. Uh, as you can basically see in the schedule, we'll do the logic of compound statements next and we will uh, do the recitation next. 
So it's only the end of the administrative information for this class. Uh, the class will only end at 12.25 p.m., which is about two hours from now. And then we'll have a recitation. So it's only the end of the first part of the first lecture. Yes, everything will use the same Google Meet. So the question is, are recitations in the same Google Meet? Are the, uh, 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 yes, same Google Meet will be used for recitations, office hours, uh, and lectures. And is attendance mandatory? No, neither for recitation nor for lecture, basically. In fact, uh, Google Meet does not tell me who's are, who are the 78 students that are currently watching the lecture. Uh, that's not included in the grading schema. The grading schema only grades homeworks and exams. Uh, excellent question. Please elaborate on the midterm and final. So basically, let's posted on Piazza. It's a very good question that I want to elaborate more. So, exams. Exams. So, all exams will be between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. on the day of the exam. Most, uh, another one, all exams will use lock on browser with monitoring. Okay, so what does that mean? So Lockdown Browser is a specific software that is like a browser. It's like uh, Chrome, but uh, it only allows you to open one tab. You go to the Blackboard. Or the class. In assignments. And the exam will appear at the end of the assignment. The exam requires you to have a webcam that will record you during the exam. So basically during the exam, you will solve the problems in that exam uh, and we will have we will have a practice exam on thursday this thursday this thursday so basically you can actually try it and if it doesn't work you have to find an alternative it's still before the deadline to withdraw from the course actually to delete the existence of this course from the, your record, really. Uh, that's mostly it. Basically, the format of the exam, the exam will contain questions and you will have a text area to solve it, solve them. If there are many more questions, you can just post them on Piazza and we'll respond to the best of our abilities. Okay. Can I explain the set builder notation and subset? Um, yes. So, there are two parts of the set builder notation. So, the first part is what is to be collected from a 
bigger set. And the second part after this vertical bar is what condition must be true for those elements to be collected in the current set. Okay. So let's see an example. The example that we just had was give me all the x from real numbers. This vertical bar can be read, read as such as. Actually, let me put here in parentheses. That vertical bar means such as. Such as minus 2 must be less than x, and x must be less than 5. OK? So this is a set builder notation. And we can write it as uh, the following interval from minus 2 to 5 in reals. Because it basically, on the real axis, this states that we want all of the real numbers strictly greater than minus 2 and strictly less than 5. That includes minus 1, includes uh, 1.2, uh, 3.4, 3, 5, not included. Any questions? Okay, there are no, so that's that's the problem, that's the biggest problem. So, because we'll have to use uh, the browser for writing formulas, it makes it much harder for us, for me, for your TAs to grade because we have to write it in some kind of an English notation. So, for instance, one thing that you may have noticed is here I did not use the standard for uh, uh, sign, this cap, for, uh, for conjunction. I actually use end. I use the English word end. So unfortunately, because we don't have a blackboard, uh, I don't have, and you do not have actually a, 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 a LaTeX editor in, in the browser, we will accept that we will use and for conjunction, similarly, or for disjunction, uh, and not or tilde. But uh, you can use not because it's e easier for negation. And similarly, like uh, for everything, for functions for uh, set theory for induction you will have to write it in english because we do not have this i mean it's possible don't get me wrong i can type using my keyboard using a forward slash and backward slash this symbol for conjunction or similarly i can use the opposite backward slash forward slash for disjunction but it's easier for all of us to use the English word. So uh, it's easier to use and and or and not instead of actually using these special symbols. It's, it's easier for you, most of it. Uh, it's, I can read these formulas easily and my TAs can also do, uh, read them. But it's easier if we do use the English words uh, because you don't have to write them in this specific notation. When you write on a piece of paper, you can use the specific notation, and I assume that you will do that. But because I don't have a blackboard in my uh, house, I, I basically will use a notepad to write similarly what you will do in the exam to write formulas. So we'll get used to it. Don't worry about that. No, I do have office hours. Um, let me actually, that's a very good question. Uh, the question to, yes. 
the, the, the practice exam that I meant on Thursday will be ju just so Thursday will just be a test of uh, lockdown browser. with monitoring. We will have real practice exams too, but later. The lecture on Thursday, I mean the uh, test on Thursday is really just for uh, making sure that you have everything required uh, for your exam because two weeks from now if you want to take the exam and you cannot actually take the exam because something doesn't work we will have a problem because at that point how am i going to administer the exam to you it's a mystery okay and but those real practice exams on next week uh we will they will be the same difficulty with the real exam. I respond to your questions. So office hours. So edit. So these are the TA's office hours. Let me change it to office hours and add myself to this. So instructor or folder. My email address, which is also posted in the syllabus, all dot folder at Stony Brook. You and let's put the office hours. Uh, nine to ten a.m. on Wednesdays. Fridays. This way uh, we'll have office hours tomorrow and Friday so you'll not miss any office hour this week uh, from me. So I, this is good. Submit. Okay. Let's see if there are any other questions. Yes, the test will be taken online as posted in the syllabus uh, on Lockdown Browser. So you only need the computer open the lockdown browser, start the test in assignments, write the answers to every single question. The questions will come one after another. You can go back. Uh, you will be recorded during the test. And after a certain time that the test has, you will be required to submit the test. And you will submit the test. And we grade question by question. The points will be added in your final number of points for that exam. You can also have scrap paper, of course. So uh, you will just show at the beginning that you do not have other things on the table but white paper or uh, basically scrap paper and a pen. So you can't basically uh, study the material during the test. Okay. Okay. So since I see no more questions, I will stop the recording.